Welcome All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. Today is Friday. We made it to the weekend, y'all. May 5th, 2023. Welcome to Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Lozier, and this is episode 360, a full revolution around of the top cyber threats, top cyber news, all the tops across the board. Thank you for being here, 8 a.m. Eastern Time. We've got a great show for you today. Over the next 45 minutes, me, Shuttle Crab, Jason Hoskins, Marcus Seiler, Matthew Necci, Dylan McDonald, Jim Lennon, so many of the Simply Cyber community, including you, are going to be tearing through the top cyber news stories of the day, and I'll be giving my opinion, my analysis on each of those stories. I do have quite a bit of uh, professional industry experience, some formal education. 50 gifted subs popping off the top. Thank you very much, Barricade Cyber Solutions. Barricade Cyber dropping a 50 spot on the gifted sub, so giddy up on that. If you are, uh, <laughs> if you're not a squad member, you're about to be one. Got to get here early, people. I'm telling you, 8 a.m. It's where it drops, guys. I'm so pumped today. Uh, it is Friday. Working towards the weekend. We're gonna have a good one. Before we get into it, I do want to shout out and shed some love for the stream sponsors, including uh, Barricade Cyber Solutions. The uh, unbelievable, uh, you know, company in, and uh, personalities behind the company that are gifting the subs right now. Thank you again, Eric Taylor. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping. Excuse me. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. What's up, Funky Monk? Getting that sub uh, membership. But guys, when the hardworking business owners are in turmoil, when the IT staff looks like they're shell-shocked, don't sweat it because Barricade Cyber Solutions can be a superhero, swoop in there and help you mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. They can talk to the threat actors, they can reduce ransoms, they can help you identify how full, how deep the compromise went, they can help you bail out. It's all about good times and helping people at Barricade Cyber. Checking them out at Barricade Cyber, another 50 drop of members Barricade Cyber. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Oh, man, we are coming in hot today on a Friday, May 5th. Thank you so much, Barricade Cyber. Look at the chat just explode. Guys, this is Barricade Cyber's website right here. I want to call your attention to, uh, if you scroll to the bottom, Eric T Taylor's phone number is right here as well as his calendar. You can get on his calendar and talk to him at 10 a.m. this morning. Guys, seriously, if you work for a business, if you're responsible for InfoSec, do not wait until you're dealing with a ransomware incident before you contact Barricade Cyber um, Solutions. Also want to say shout out and love to XM Cyber. <clears throat> XM Cyber, a great stream sponsor, focusing on that exposure management space. Love what they're doing. Listen, organizations are overwhelmed with thousands of exposures across cloud and on-prem environments on a monthly basis. So officially reducing risk is almost impossible. I would argue it's quite impossible. It's just overwhelming. Discover the most critical threats and practical tips on how to overcome remediation fatigue, which means you just become apathetic. You know, like you're like, oh, we're never going to dig out of this. What's the point? Who cares? You can use a new approach to efficiently reduce risk with XM Cyber's 2023 State of Exposure Management report available out now. The link, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a link in the description below. It says XM Cyber. I strongly encourage you to go check it out. Please use my link, click on it, and I'm going to show you what you're going to get. This is the report right here. It's based on the Intel that XM Cyber is seeing in their client base. So it's based on actual telemetry. It's based on real life um, incidents and you know threat actor behavior and stuff like that. Exposure management, it's all about uh, addressing choke points. It goes beyond vulnerabilities. It has to do with mismanaged configurations. I'm looking at you, Carl. Oh. S3 buckets that are leaky, mismanaged credentials, etc. Go check it out. Links in the description below. Also, a lot of love being thrown at Panopsi Security, but more about them at the mid-roll. Guys, if you're here live, you're obviously getting um, all these squad memberships. Kimberly's helping out people who don't know how to grab a squad membership. You do have to... Um, you do, Hold on, I'm going to read Kimberly's. You do have to click the green gifted sub at the top and click accept if you aren't a member already. If you are a LinkedIn 
If you're viewing on LinkedIn right now, I strongly encourage you to pop open a, a web browser, head on over to YouTube, come to the Simply Cyber Chat and grab up one of these squad memberships. There's 100 in there, 153 in chat right now. So you better get them before the getting's good, uh, before the getting's gone. Hashtag Team Live if you're live with us right now. Genuinely appreciate you guys. I'm loving this 8 a.m. Eastern uh, every single day. It's very nice for, um, you know, for me personally. Like, it's it's very consistent. It's predictable. I love it. Um, let me do this really quickly. All right. If you are watching on replay, hashtag Team Replay, it is possible for you to get some of these squad memberships on Team Replay if it, if it boils over. Uh, in this instance today, I, I don't think it may happen, but happy Cinco de Mayo, all the same. Drop a comment, Team Replay. Um, at a minimum, just say hashtag Team Replay. But no, let me know where you're at, and uh, let me know where you're at and how you're doing, Team Replay. Want to say what's up to Team Hybrid? Ooh, Christopher Cahal, remind me of Jaw Jacket, and we'll bring up TCM Security's website and take a look at, we'll sniff around at what they got. Uh, or mods, if you can drop a link for TCM Dollar Classes, I'd love to take a look at that and share it with the community. Uh, finally, uh, Team Hybrid, if you got here late, you're catching up, that's you, so hit a Team Hybrid. Let us know that you're here and getting caught up. And if you are, hashtag Passive Observer, my favorite. If you're a little shy, Imposter Syndrome, just dropped an Imposter Syndrome video on the channel. If you're shy, if you don't know how to start networking, especially if you know how valuable networking is, but you haven't, you're, you're, you're reluctant to do it, drop a hashtag Passive Observer in chat right now. Let us, you know, say hi to you. And Kyle Moraine, there you go. See, what's up, Kyle? It's good to see you. Thanks for taking a step forward into the light and start your networking journey today. Guys, networking so, so, so valuable. Anthony Branch saying good morning. Good to see you. Guys. I want to remind you, each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is worth half a CPE, so don't be shy. Get those CPEs. They stack up two and a half a week, 10 a month. Uh, if you've been here a while, you got CPEs coming out your ears, so you're not sweating those when it comes to renewing your certifications, all right? But now it's time. We've gone through the mid-roll. It's time to sit back, relax, and let the cool sounds of the hot news wash over you in an awesome wave. I'll see you guys at the mid-roll. From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. It's Friday, May 5th, 2023. City of Dallas hit by royal ransomware attack impacting IT services. The ninth largest city in the United States with a population of approximately 2.6 million people saw some of its IT systems shut down to prevent the attack's spread. Local media reported that the city's police, communications and IT systems were shut down on Monday morning due to a suspected ransomware attack, leading to 911 dispatchers having to write down received reports for officers rather than submit them via the computer-assisted dispatch system. The Dallas County Police Department's website was also offline for part of the day due to the security incident but has since been restored. The city's court system canceled all jury trials and jury duty from May 2nd into yesterday, and according to numerous sources, network printers on the city of Dallas's network began printing out ransom notes that taunted the city over its choice of cybersecurity procedures. A photo of the ransom note made it appear that the Royal Ransomware Operation conducted the attack. All right, so a couple things here. One, um... <laughs> One, being slightly playful. This is one way to get out of jury duty. It is one way to get out of jury duty. There are easier ways, I would argue, but um, I'm being a little playful. So we covered this story as breaking news yesterday uh, at the end of chat during Jaw Jack in time. But city of Dallas, huge city in Texas, uh, hit by ransomware. Royal ransomware doesn't really care. They hit Oakland, which is another major city in the United States. I believe they were responsible for Minneapolis. Guys, hitting municipalities is not challenge. I mean, it's not it's not easy, but it's not super sophisticated. It's not a financial management company. Um, oftentimes, we talk about it in the past, like state and local uh, IT. They're underserved. They don't get budget. They don't you know renew do system lifecycle replacements and stuff like that. I would assume city of Dallas is no different. Um, and this has been happening. Um, I, no, Medusa is the one who hit the school system up in Minneapolis. Um, so, so, um, here's, here's a couple things with this one. 
nine one one was impacted in some way. So now there's st you're still able to call nine one one, but dispatchers were having to write down and communicate out of band to police officers. Obviously, this results in a slower response time, um, which you know is, we're talking pretty scary here, right? Like nine one one, my house is on fire. Like okay, we'll get you there as soon as possible. Um, again, Barricade Cyber, thanks so much for the memberships. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. So, you know, hopefully this doesn't result in, you know, some type of violent crime going uh, a little bit longer than it needed to or somebody's house burning down faster than it needed to or even, heck, somebody having uh, a heart attack and not being able to get paramedics there in a timely manner. Um, the court systems went down. I, now, I will say another thing that Dallas did, and I got to tell you, um, let me see this. It's a little bit of a meme, but I mean, it's totally appropriate right now. Right. Um, where is it? Yeah. Right here. You've seen, if you've ever, you know, if you've been in it for a minute, you've seen this, right. Um, in case of a cyber attack, break glass and pull cables. This is basically like rip the internet out guys. I got to tell you, Dallas did this. Somebody in Dallas, somebody in Dallas made the call. Holy crap. Unplug everything. And guys, that's not an easy decision to make. Like it seems like in the in the you know retrospect of it's like, oh yeah, of course we would pull the internet. I'm telling you guys, I have been in it an incident with like ransomware. And you know, like before you fully diagnose what's happening, when you see hallmarks of bad stuff happening, pulling the internet is a catastrophically um business altering decision and you better be dang sure and most people err on the side of caution of not unplugging the internet so whoever made the decision in dallas to do it uh definitely appreciate it this is the joke that goes with it but absolutely uh <laughs> absolutely here we go um compliments of bsec um we got john taffer yelling shut it down down in dallas very cool um so I would expect Dallas to continue to uh, recover from this attack. Um, adding insult to injury, I, I actually, I'm not saying I like it, but I will give them um, a, a few points for style. Um, Royal ransomware forcing printers to print out the ransomware note. Typically the ransomware note just sits on the desktop of the compromised machines. And when users try to use the machine, the only thing they can do is I mean, they can do a couple things, but really all they can do is see the ransom note on the desktop and then they find it. Printing it out, this is the first instance that I have heard of, of printers printing out the ransom notes as part of the attack. Um, uh, Eric Taylor, Barricade Cyber, any, any blue team operators out there, if you've seen this before, holler in chat, let me know. But for me, um, and of course, you, you can see they've got, if you read the note, it's like a little tongue in cheek. It's, it's kind of arrogant. Um, anyways, so ransomware, it still sucks. It still attacks businesses. It, it's, it doesn't care who you are. It's like the Terminator it doesn't sleep. It doesn't eat. It doesn't care who you are. It doesn't care if, you know, you bring down emergency services. It just, it wants its money, right? Like that scene from Goodfellas or casino, like you pay me feeling tired. You pay me. You know what I mean? So anyways, let's keep rolling. Researchers uncover new exploit for paper cut vulnerability that can bypass detection. Tracked as CVE 2023-27350 with a CVSS score of 9.8, the issue affects paper cut MF and NG installations that could be exploited by an unauthenticated attacker to execute arbitrary code with system privileges. Vulnacek has published a proof-of-concept exploit that sidesteps existing detection signatures by affecting the print management software's user group sync feature, which makes it possible to synchronize user and group information from Active Directory, LDAP, or a custom source. All right. Mirai Bot. I mean, okay, so this is another kind of like interesting um, micro situation that has macro lesson learning capabilities. All right, so PaperCut is this uh, printer management solution in large organizations. You're not going to go to every printer. In large organizations, if you go from Office A to Office B or the Austin office to the Houston office, you're not going to install new printer drivers and stuff like that, right? So they have these print management services that allow you to seamlessly go around um, 
Thank you very much, Barricade. I see that. So one recent case, the threat actor sent a thousand print jobs to each printer in the entire organization. So that's a little bit of a terrorizing attack too, right? Um, okay, so the paper cut thing, um, exposing this. Now, here's the lesson learned in big picture stuff. And this is something you could drop in a job interview. Yes, it's paper cut. Yes, there you should be patching. Um, you should be patching, right? So if you patch, then it's no longer there. The detection is just showing you if the compromise has happened and the paper cut um, has been exploited. Threat actors, guys, here's the deal. Like, it's not like we can only release the detection rules to the good guys. We do that a little bit with ISACs, but for the most part, indicators of compromise are released publicly. Threat actors know this. Really good threat actors take those indicators of compromise, put them in their own lab, run their exploits, and, and refine them and adjust them until... Thanks, Gary Ruddle. Good to see you, Gary Ruddle. Guys, la ladies and gentlemen, Gary Ruddle in chat. Uh, YouTuber, cybersecurity content creator. He's going to be on Simply Cyber Live on May 25th, so be sure to check that out. Throw uh, Gary a little bit of love here. So, guys, here's the deal. Um, the threat actors can find the indicators of compromise. They put it in their own lab. They run the exploit. Oh, it, it's detected. They run the exploit. Oh, it's detected. Tweak, tweak, tweak. They run the exploit. It's not detected. Push it back into production. Dude, threat actors with exploits, they're just like software developers. They do continuous integration, continuous development. They implement those DevOps best practices. Because why? Because they want their malware to run, right? Conti ransomware. Go read the Conti leaks. Um, Brian Krebs on Krebs on Security did an excellent five-part series kind of aggregating and distilling the essence of all of the Conti leaks. Conti was a massive uh, ransomware group, aka Wizard Spider, if you're going to Google it. And they had like 100 employees. They had a whole dev team, QA, QC team, um, like HR. They had the whole works. but And that's why they were able to be so successful in cranking stuff out because they were doing this constant check to make sure that their malware was going to hit and that's what's happening here so guys either shut down paper cut patch it or be you know increase your risk profile and be mindful that you're probably going to get slapped in the mouth all right especially especially if it's internet facing that first of all you should try to make it not internet facing as much as possible yes flaming donkey the apt flaming donkey has been seen in the wild <laughs> using paper cut <laughs> Uh, uh, that's, for those, like, I don't like inside jokes. So for those who are here, Flaming Donkey is Simply Cyber's um, go-to uh, avatar for APTs, just like Carl's our end user. It loves exploiting unpatched TP-Link routers, warns CISA. CISA is adding three more flaws to its list of known exploited vulnerabilities, including one involving TP-Link routers that is being targeted by the operators of the notorious Mirai botnet. Trend Micro's zero-day initiative threat hunting group stated in a report released last week that operators of the Mirai botnet were beginning to exploit the flaw primarily by attacking devices in Eastern Europe, though the campaign soon expanded beyond that region. Mirai malware rolls up infected Linux-based IoT devices into a botnet that can then be remotely controlled to perform large-scale network attacks, including DDoS assaults. The other two flaws placed on the CISA list this week involve versions of Oracle's WebLogic server software and the Apache Foundation's Log4J Java logging library. All right. Drone. Okay, so it is it is the register. So I, I just saw it right here. You know the the this particular reporter at the register does use the word miscreants quite a bit, and we got we got a hit right here. So uh, I do love it when we see the miscreants. Okay, guys. So here's the deal. Uh, Mirai Botnet, uh, which famously, like if you want to study an actual really great uh, case study on a botnet uh, and just <laughs> like also who the threat actors were that did it and their boneheaded decision to try to hide from law enforcement um, seemed like a good idea at the time. These, these uh, college kids at Rutgers uh, wrote Mirai. The feds were on to them. So they released Mirai publicly thinking that, ooh, a bunch of people will use it and then we'll hide in the noise. They release it and like the feds already had the full case ready and was ready to arrest them, arrested them. And then everybody has their own Mirai. You can go on GitHub right now and download multiple versions of Mirai. Now, interestingly, Mirai only um, its infection vehicle was targeting Telnet, which I did not know. Someone actually had to educate me on that. And I was like, holy crap. And I went back and looked at the actual source code. Sure enough. 
It was going after Telnet, uh, but obviously future instances of Mirai have been developed to attack um, other aspects, other components for initial infection. Um, its spreading mechanism hasn't really changed. And, you know, what it does after compromise has changed as well. You can see right now it's it's um, it's taking over um, a, a, a non, like a no, like it doesn't require authentication, <clears throat> infection of some IoT devices. <clears throat> so um, you got to be careful of that. See, an unauthorized attacker can exploit this hole to inject commands that could lead to RCE uh, in device firmware in TP-Link's Archer AX1. Uh, AX21 Wi-Fi 6 router. So so basically, long story short, guys, anything that you have facing the internet, which by the way, you should use Shodan Monitor, Shodan Monitor to look at and see what your external network uh, surface looks like, right? So like, what are you actually trying to uh, uh, protect? What What is your exposure looks like? Uh, because Mirai can hit it, right? If you're running these TP-Link routers, you could be in trouble. Mirai's been around a long time. It's 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 infection vehicle does change though, so be mindful of that. Obviously, you should be uh, keeping up with CISA. Give me a little Jen Easterly love if you would, squad members. I'm going to drop a little Jen Easterly love. CISA uh, doing their part to keep everybody informed, but yeah, it just Mirai's not going away, man. And I'm telling you, it's it's not quite ChatGPT, but it's like that where like the genie's out the bottle as soon as those kids release the source code. Google's maker claims firmware sabotaged to brick devices. Orca, spelt O-R-Q-A, a maker of first-person view drone racing goggles, claims that a contractor introduced code into its device's firmware that acted as a time bomb designed to brick them. On Saturday, Orca started receiving reports from customers surprised to see their FPV-1 V1 goggles enter bootloader mode and become unusable. The company said they found the ransomware time bomb, which had been secretly planted a few years ago by a, quote, greedy former contractor, end quote, with an intention to extract exorbitant ransom from the company. Okay, first of all, um, Great cash, homie. second of all, um, I wish I had the sound bit of you are so dumb for real, like the Antoine Dobson, you are so dumb sound bit. Okay, so some... <sighs> Okay, so it doesn't matter that it's a first-person drone flying technology. It could be any technology. Some contractor who had access to code, and by the way, I don't want you to focus on the fact that it was a contractor, okay? Because it could have been an employee just the same. Although, I bet you the contractor went through less background checks and scrutiny. That's one additional problem with professional services. A lot of businesses will push down the uh, background check and screening down into the... Um, consulting firm and who knows if they do that or not that's a third party risk you got to be mindful of anyways this donkey not not to be confused with flaming donkey okay just a uh, typical donkey this donkey uh introduced uh, a, a logic bomb which by the way that's a that's a you know a definition on security plus probably or cissp a logic bomb a piece of malware or a a function that is not desirable for the greater good of the software to run at a specific time usually like a scheduled task or a certain date and time hits right so may 5th at 9 a.m something bad's going to happen okay logic bomb this this guy yeah seriously kimberly this guy drops it into the code base it gets uploaded to everything and then at a certain time, people are powering up their FPS devices and they're basically bricking. Bricking means that it's basically just that, a brick. It's just, it's a piece of hardware that weighs a bunch that doesn't do anything anymore because you've basically screwed it. Now, here's my two cents on this. This guy's a dummy because are you seriously, like, how are you going to ransom? How are you going to hold these people ransom? It's like, yeah, I used to work there. Um, pay me. It's like, dude, we know who you are. Like, you are, you're going to jail. Like, there's, like, there's no level of anonymity or obfuscation. They can see who committed the code to the code base. You, 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 you donkey. Like, the perpetrator was particularly perfidious because he kept occasional business relations with us over these last few years, and he's waiting for the code bomb to detonate, presumably not to raise suspicion. Guys, they're going to know. Okay, so 
whatever. This, I would imagine this guy's going to get arrested in some capacity. Certainly not going to get paid. I hope to goodness that the um, it's not like a flashing attack where they've like permanently screwed up the firmware. Usually with these type of devices, um, not always, but some of these devices um like like a raspberry pi and stuff you, it like it uses an sd card for its kind of operating system and stuff like that so you might be able to push uh a firmware update and kind of reverse back um the the brick the brick devices changes obviously the the, the company is going to have um insurance policy i would assume around dealing with something like this um, some individuals are going to be screwed. I don't know if this will be like a massive impact for these individuals. It doesn't say um, how many are affected. Yeah, it says uh, our security review has found that only a fraction of the code was affected by the malware and fixes are being done as we speak. So yeah, so this this guy, man, what what a what a mis misled fool, right? So he put the code in there, waited years detonated it it barely impacted the business and he like outed himself as the donkey right so just not not a good move all right now let's do the mid-roll sponsor trend micro Cybersecurity is not just about protection it's about foresight agility and resilience Navigating a new era of cyber risk demands evolved strategies, new frameworks, and integrated tools to equip security teams to anticipate and defend against even the most advanced attacks. Trend Micro, the global leader in cybersecurity, is bringing the cyber risk conversation to more than 120 cities around the world in their latest Risk to Resilience World Tour, the largest cybersecurity roadshow of its kind. Find the closest city to you and register today to take a leap towards a more resilient future. Head to trendmicro.com slash CISO series for more information. All right, y'all, it's mid roll. Let's do this. Cisco. All right, guys, I want to thank each and every one of you for being here. 242 of you great people here live in chat right now. So many more watching on replay. Thank you to the stream sponsors XM Cyber, Barricade Cyber with their 100 squad uh, membership drop. Hopefully, everybody. Uh, has grabbed a squad. Andrew Escobar, grab up one of those squad memberships, my friend. Get your name in green. Get the little badge logo next to your name. Uh, and thank you to Panopsi Security. Listen, guys, Panopsi Security, I mentioned him earlier, but let me actually do the read. Panopsi Security um, does many different uh, security services, but one of the exceptional services they provide is a quantified risk assessment. Now, why would you want a quantified risk assessment? If you don't really have a, a plan on where you're going with your security program, if you're just like buying random stuff or implementing random things, a quantified risk assessment can look at your people, process, and technology, look at your threat model based on your industry and business size, and actually give you a statistically sound fact-based output of how likely you are in your current security posture to suffer a ransomware incident or to suffer a business email compromise or to not be able to recover from a, um, some type of event. Based on that, you can then get, um, you know, kind of scenario permutations of, well, if you invest X amount of dollars on an MDM solution, the probability of this type of attack goes down by 18%. It really enables you to have meaningful, deliberate conversations with the CFO, straight cash, homie, or the CEO, really the executives. Plus it makes you look like an all-star to the board because you have all of this like sound information, your graphics, your donut charts, they all look better. Um, quantified risk assessments from Panopsi Security, definitely a best practice if that's where you are in your current um, career, like cyber career program or cyber program maturity model. Again, if you got a hot second, I would genuinely appreciate all 243 of you to hit the like button right now. Hit the subscribe if you want. We do this every single weekday morning. We do lives on Thursday and we're doing produced videos all every Wednesday, every week with a focus on ChatGPT right now. But hit the like button. It helps other people find the show, basically. That's the deal. If you hit like, other people looking for cybersecurity content on YouTube will be told about this show. Guys, if you want to get on the newsletter, I do it on Sundays. You receive it on Monday. So here's your last chance to get on it for this particular week. SimplyCyber.io slash newsletter. Sign up. If you don't like it, unsubscribe. I don't care. Like, it, I do it as a community service, right? I think it delivers value. 
A lot of people in chat think it delivers value. You make the decision. Sign up, see if it's for you, and if not, unsubscribe. We're cool. Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Guys, this is a way for you to build your network professionally. Margarita is in chat right now. She posted her cyber story right here. Military spouse, 11 years, two degrees, an apprenticeship. She's straight crushing it like a boss. Margarita, if you're in chat, would genuinely appreciate you tagging somebody. Whoever Margarita tags, please go on LinkedIn, share your cyber story. Use the hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. And everybody, go find uh, Margarita's post. I'm not even, hold on, I'm not connected to Margarita. Let me connect with Margarita. Boom. Hold on one second. Jerry from Simply Cyber. This is how easy it is, guys. Boom. Build your network. Connect with other people. It's fantastic. It's the best way to do it. Build your network. Meaningful connections. Have a good time. Uh, Jenny Housley, uh, if you're in chat. Oh, there's Margarita. Nathan Gaps, you're up. Boom. Boom, baby. Nathan, let us know you accept the challenge. Guys, Grayson's joke of the week. Uh, Jason, uh, Grayson told me a joke, but it was one we've already used on the show, so I have a plan B lined up. I don't know if you guys heard about the new um, pizza delivery service that, or a pizza company that's taking advantage of ChatGPT. Very hot thing right now. Unfortunately, they had to file bankruptcy so soon. They weren't able to uh, meet any of their deliveryables. Any of their delivery of balls. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the joke of the day. I know that was a little bit of a dad joke, but we're just doing what we can uh, here to keep the uh, agenda rolling and make sure that we're hitting all of the items in the agenda, including joke of the week. Thank you very much, Grayson, for your continued support of the show. All right, guys, let's slide back in and then we'll get to jaw jacking. Warns of critical vulnerability in end of life phone adapters. Cisco this week raised the alarm on a critical remote code execution vulnerability impacting SPA-112 two-port phone adapters, which have reached end-of-life status. Tracked as CVE-2023-20126 with a CVSS score of 9.8, this law impacts the web-based management interface of the phone's adapters and can be exploited without authentication. As Cisco explains in its advisory, the vulnerability exists because of a, quote, missing authentication process within the firmware upgrade function, end quote. Given that the SPA-112 two-port phone adapters are no longer supported since they reached the end of life on June 1st, 2020, Cisco does not plan to release firmware updates to address the vulnerability. All right. Uh, this one's a pretty quick one. So uh, really quickly, if you're if you're new here, if you're just breaking in the industry, a CVSS score of 9.8 is really bad, okay? It goes 10 is the worst, but uh, really uh, uh, most times what you'll see is um, the highest will be 9.8, and then they'll bump it up to 10 once it's being actively exploited in the wild, okay? So nine, if you see 9.8, just know that to, to me, when I see 9.8, that means it's the worst and it's not being actively exploited in the wild. Okay, once we scroll down, you can actually see that the story goes on to say it's not aware of it being exploited currently, which is consistent with what I just told you. Um, so that's just like a pro tip. Um, keep that in mind. All right, guys, here's the thing. It's an end of life technology, which means the vendor does not support it, which means if it, there will be no security patch for it. And if it gets compromised, there's no fixing it okay uh these are spa 112 two port phones from cisco if you're running these devices you should know this and you should be mindful of it unfortunately um unfortunately what happens is like a lot of smaller businesses that can't afford new tech buy secondhand tech um sometimes vendors will sell you uh old tech at a discounted rate and you think you're getting a deal but instead you're just getting like a headache uh be mindful of these uh, the, I will tell you, it's not being maliciously uh, um, exploited in the wild right now, so that's good. Secondly, a threat actor would need to develop a custom firmware, okay? Remote attacker needs to upgrade a device to a crafted firmware version. So the threat actor needs to get the firmware. I don't think that those exist right now, so now you need a more sophisticated threat actor uh, to develop a custom firmware that would allow them arbitrary code execution, which just... Like when you're thinking of like how bad is this vulnerability, you have to think of a couple things. How easy is it to exploit, you know, et cetera. What's the impact of exploitation? But you also think to have to think of like who is the threat actor and what level of skill do they need and how much time do they need in order to exploit it? This one right here, I would I would escalate it a little bit higher because 
dude, like script. Um, well, script kitty, I think, is now being phased out as politically incorrect. But lower skilled threat actors are not able to write custom firmware. OK, so so like the bulk of your threat actors aren't really going to be exploiting this. Your more sophisticated ones possibly could. But you've got to remember they're going to be attacking nation states. They're going to be attacking like financial service companies, crypto exchanges, etc. For the most part, those types of entities are going to be well funded and or you know, I I know state and local aren't as funded as well, but they're typically not running end of life technologies, right? They are a little bit better than that and keeping it current. Um so long story short, if you are running this um, you want to get rid of them or, or phase it out. Um, eventually know this about the CVSS score nine, eight. And then the final thing I'll tell you, and this is like a, this is a snake eyes. The more, you know, just because, um, it comes up, you guys know if you're a regular of the show occasionally, like these things just drop in my brain and I feel like I got to share it to you guys. Whenever, um, it or the business or whomever is trying to buy technology, you really should be involved as an InfoSec professional. Okay, why, Jerry? Listen to this. I have literally seen this and it's infuriating, okay? When I worked at the medical university, um, you know, some some department, right? The ophthalmology department wants to buy new tech. Okay, cool. Don't tell us what tech we need, nerd. Like, we're buying the tech. Okay, here's the deal. The vendor had the tech. They had the Windows, um, what was it? I think Windows 7 version at the time. And then Windows like XP version. And the Windows 7 version, right, was like $200,000 a unit. And they're like, oh, but hey, we've got the Windows XP version, which they're like for 50000 a unit. And like they don't explain to the the buying person, the the, the business, right, that it's XP versus seven. They just say, hey, we've got two different versions. They literally do the same thing functionally. And one's 200 grand and one's 50 grand. Which one do you want? Well, dude, a hundred out of a hundred times, the business is going to be like, Great cash, homie. give me the cheaper one. It does the same thing functionally, right? I can still x-ray my patients. I can still make 3D models or whatever it is, right? Give me the cheaper one. The problem is, obviously, the second it comes through, now we've got an end of life technology on our network. It's not going to get patched. It introduces risk, all this crap. And oh, by the way, like they didn't keep the receipts. So good luck returning that. Plus it's been integrated into the business. It's a hot mess on fire. So you want to have standards on what's allowed and what's not allowed. You definitely want to be involved. When I say get involved from a third party risk or a, a you know, kind of a, a, a product assessment perspective, don't be so in the weeds that like, oh, like, you know, this is running like uh you know, whatever, TLS 1.1, not TLS 1.2. Like, you're not going to win those battles. But spend your political capital a little bit on like, dude, listen, I, like I understand that you only have a $200,000 budget and you can buy four of these machines or one of these machines, but this is end of life. This is not acceptable. And then this is where you need to like either have political capital, get buy-in from the business, have already get the CISO to have a good relationship with the business or the IT people. It gets complicated, but just be mindful that the threat... um vendors are trying to do that because they have this old tech on their shelf and they're like how the hell am i gonna oh sorry kennedy how am i gonna sell this old dingy crap like it i'm gonna put it in a yard sale no i'm going to discount it and sell it to somebody who doesn't know any better yes and then you know obviously they meet their sales numbers and they get the trip to the cayman islands just be mindful of that it happens all the time also also bonus fact hold on do i have a sounder for bonus fact um bonus, what would be a bonus fact um okay bonus fact another thing that i have seen vendors do which is absolutely deplorable if you have gotten into the uh, procurement workflow which some of us have right you get into the procurement workflow anything technology coming through gets to go through infosec as well i have seen vendors sell literally a hundred thousand tongue depressors okay and then the technology is free. So they'll sell you, you know, like they'll sell you a thousand tongue depressors for $200,000. So it shows up on the sheet. This is what we're buying. We need to cut a PO. We need to cut a check for this. And then complimentary, they throw in this Windows XP machine. 
So it doesn't go through procurement because it doesn't get a PO or anything. It just gets thrown in. And then, you know, it comes through the InfoSec office and you're like, well, 100,000 tongue depressors. I'm not going to look at this. There's nothing here for me to look at. And then all of a sudden, boom, you got this piece of old tech pop up on your network. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. No, we, we bought it from the vendor. And it's like, no, you like the vendors know how to circumvent procurement processes in order to get some of this tech through. So just be mindful. That's a trick. That's a tricky trick. And it's not one that you'll ever read in a textbook. University warns of campus text alerts sent by ransomware group. Bluefield University, a private Baptist school in Bluefield, Virginia, serving about 1,000 students. Yeah, Kennedy is a fourth grader. As far as I know, she's our youngest regular listening uh, member who uh, is old enough. We, we do have another one named Emerson that's like a year and a half old, but I think she's just hanging with her dad as she listens. Students issued a warning about texts being sent through the school's mass alert system after a ransomware group messaged the entire campus about an ongoing cyber attack. On Tuesday, the AVOS locker group used the school's RAM alert system to send threatening messages out to all of Bluefield University's students and employees, announcing that they had exfiltrated 1.2 terabytes of files consisting of admissions data. The school published its own message on Tuesday acknowledging that the RAM alert system had been taken over by the hackers and warning students not to click on any links provided by those hackers. No. Yep, all right. So um, a couple of interesting things here. One, um, university gets taken over. No surprise, this, <clears throat> this has happened. We've seen, um, who's done this? I think Vice has done this. And Lockbit, Medusa obviously has taken over uh, K through 12 up in Minneapolis. So I'm not sure what threat actor group did this. I'd be interested if anyone in um, chat knows about this particular story. But here's the thing. A lot of these universities have, especially in the, the age of active shooters, right? Starting or active threats on campus, starting with that um, just tragic nightmare uh, on Virginia Tech, you know, 15 years ago. Um, they have these alert systems, right? The Citadel has one, it's called Bulldog, and they use it to do mass communications in an emergent manner. And it's a, it's a good system if you think about it, but obviously threat actors got in here. Uh, they found the way to the keys to be able to use that system, which is unfortunate because that really should be, uh, locked down and only accessible by certain people for an emergency. Um, oh, I guess it's Avos Locker. I, I don't know who they are, but um they ran somewhere and then, and then like basically threat actors are trying to leverage and and put pressure on victims to pay the ransom whether they publicly leak documents whether they make that like you know youtube video that medusa did for minneapolis whatever it is whether they print out a thousand printer jobs like um royal did in dallas it, it, you know, the, the techniques change from incident to incident, but the, the intent is always the same. They are trying to put pressure on the victim to pay the ransom. Now, in this instance, they basically blew up the school's spot but to all the student body that the student body's data had been, uh, thank you, barricade, um, that the student's uh, data had been compromised. Obviously, now you're going to get students and parents calling in wanting to know, hey, what are you going to do? How are you protecting our data? What's this mean to me? This causes a whole host of problems. The school is obviously trying to actively handle the incident, right? Like, so their head's down handling the incident. And then all of a sudden this happens. And now they got to turn around and they're dealing with like thousands of students, tens of thousands of parents wanting to know what they're going to do about it. So it's, it's very, very disruptive and very chaotic. Again, you should really practice tabletop exercises with the entire business on how you would handle ransomware and use this as an exact incident um, for an inject on, okay, what are we going to do now? They just sent out this RAM alert. Um, one thing I will say, what a missed opportunity um, by the threat actors. Obviously, they just want ransomware money, but they could have set out a link to a phishing landing page uh, and compromised a whole host of people and kind of expanded their attack surface easily. Um, again, mostly students are going to click on it. So maybe it's not a target rich environment. You might be able to get some faculty and stuff, but I, I just, I mean, this is interesting. Um, it's an interesting technique. So I don't know if, I almost wonder if Avos stumbled upon the RAM alert emergency broadcast system and figured like, let's just use it. Or if that was part of their actual 
um, play, play, uh, not play map, uh, playbook, playbook. Nine out of 10 companies. It's a good one to add to your, um, to your injects though. It's detected software supply chain security risks. Global research conducted by Dimensional Research and commissioned by Reversing Labs revealed that nearly 90% of technology professionals detected significant risks in their software supply chain in the last year. More than 70% said that current application security solutions aren't providing necessary protections. More than 300 global executives, technology and security professionals at all seniority levels directly responsible for software at enterprise companies were surveyed for the study. Among the findings was the sentiment that a lack of proper tools may be exacerbating software supply chain risk. Web All right, so two things here. One, this is true. Nine out of 10 companies detected software supply chain security risks, okay? But don't think that like it is supply chain risk is a problem right now. But just know that in my opinion, my expert opinion, and remember, I don't see any of these stories beforehand. So this is my hot take at the moment. This is so high because now businesses are actively looking at their supply chain risk, okay? So it's not necessarily an increase in supply chain risk as, as much as it is a actual um, measurement and understanding of what supply chain risk is by these companies. They're starting to look at it, okay? Um, a you know, global research was done. 70% of businesses said the current application security solutions aren't providing necessary protections. Um, Dude, it's no surprise. And this actually, you know what? Not to plug um, XM Cyber, but the exposure management company that's one of the uh, show sponsors. But here's here's the real deal, guys. Like, you get a system up and running, like, oh, it's able to produce product, or it's able to, you know, take in orders and send out requests to the manufacturing people, or whatever supply, like uh, logistics, whatever it is, right? If it's working. If it's not broke, don't fix it, right? You've heard that before. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Well, that's kind of like been the mantra. So like, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Well, it's it's got mismanaged configurations and it's got way too many permissions allowed and all these other things. Yes, but it's not broke, so don't fix it. So that, that kind of like um, archaic way of thinking has resulted in this stagnation of actually reducing exposure, reducing risk. And because supply chain security risks are so real now and so um, you know front of mind, businesses are starting to think about it. And that idea is no, no longer kind of um, appropriate or best practice in business. So be mindful. Um, it's worth noting that supply chain risk, if you want to know more about it, Look at NIST Cybersecurity Framework version 1.2. Um, they actually added, it was like the biggest update to 1.2. Um, they added a supply chain uh, category or function. You could see here, right here. Oh my God. Uh, you could see it right here. They added this. Now this is from May of 2022. So it's it's a little bit old, but that's why I'm telling you it, right? Um, if you want more information on supply chain, this is an absolute best place to start, in my opinion. Way to go, NIST. Of course, if you're a squad member, you can totally use the iHeart NIST emote right now, which would be absolutely appropriate. Um, so go check that out. No surprise. Supply chain, it's a real thing. Site that promised jobs at the U.S. Postal Service leaks customer data. Brian Krebs describes how a sprawling online company based in Georgia has made tens of millions of dollars purporting to sell access to jobs at the United States Postal Service and has now had its internal IT operations and database of nearly 900,000 customers exposed. The leaked records indicate the network's chief technology officer in Pakistan had been hacked for the past year and that the entire operation was created by the principles of a Tennessee-based telemarketing firm that has promoted USPS employment websites since 2016. Further investigation revealed a long-running international operation that has been emailing and text messaging people for years to sign up at a slew of websites that all promise they can help visitors secure employment at the USPS. Sites like federaljobcenter.com also show up prominently in Google search results for USPS employment and steer applicants towards making credit card registration deposits to ensure that one's application for employment is reviewed. These sites also sell training supposedly to help ace an interview with USPS Human Resources. All right. Remember All right, so this this is unfortunate, okay? Um 
Okay, so this is exploiting uh, people who are vulnerable and in a tough position. Um, it, you know, Kimberly is saying recruitment fraud is real. It is recruitment fraud, but you know what's interesting is like based on what I just heard from the story and looking at it, it's like there's a shed of a shred of like reality to it too. It's deplorable. Like sometimes I think about like, like, like this whole business model is jacked up. Basically, um, the problem here is that customer data of this company, which as far as I can tell is a legitimate company. So it's not truly fraud, although it is scummy. Okay. So I will say that I don't think this is illegal, but I think it's deplorable. Um, basically one of the members, they happen to be in Pakistan, but I almost think that that is irrelevant to the story and they just added it to be salacious. Uh, one of the employees of the company got compromised and ultimately the threat actors were able to leverage that compromise to dump the customer database of this business, which included personal information and credit card information. Okay. So that's it. Now what's, what's really interesting is basically the business model of this Tennessee based company was to just basically sit on top of United States post office uh, job posting boards and act as almost like a funnel into uh, into it. And people could come there. Obviously, they had great SEO and marketing. People could come there and they would say like, oh, here's a bunch of jobs. We'll help you with that. We'll help you. We know what the um, resumes need to look like. We know what the um, interviews are supposed to be like. So we can help you with all that. I, I probably think that they did help people get jobs at the USPS. Um, and they made tens of millions of dollars selling for 40 to a hundred dollars per person access to this platform. Okay. But in reality, like they're just selling, it's, it's like, it'd be like me taking like LinkedIn jobs and then putting like my own website up that just has like an API call to LinkedIn jobs and be like, I've got exclusive, simply cyber job recruiting. I can find you financial services, cyber jobs, and tell you how to ease the interview. And it, and it, it looks legit. Again, it's preying on vulnerability. Obviously, there was good marketing here, uh, but at the end of the day, I don't know if they were really selling something uh, that was valuable. But unfortunately, a lot of people's information got compromised. That's that's a fact. Remember to join us later today for our week. All right, so that's going to do it. We're at eight fifty-two. Apologies to um, base case in the NCC group for going over. We always try to hit forty-five minutes, but we didn't, guys. If you are here just for the news, thank you very much. Have a wonderful weekend. <clears throat> uh, we're going to do a little bit of jaw jacking, which if you're not familiar, if you're new here or whatever, I wrap up the news. And that way people who just want the news can peace out and not feel like I'm wasting their time. But I like to spend the last, you know, five to ten minutes of the show answering questions, um, networking with the community. I'm, you know, a practitioner and just a... Just another guy over here who likes to network and, and share, you know, knowledge with, with other folks. So that's what we do in the jaw jacking segment. All right. Let's see. Yeah, Eric Q's right. Elderly and vulnerable getting scammed is deplorable. I hate it. Medine, you're welcome. My pleasure. Again, thanks to uh, Simply um, Barricade Cyber for the 100 squad members. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Have a good one, John Bruno. Good to see you. Alex Mayride's in the house with uh, ChatGPT. Shall we play a game? Carrie's asking about the cyber shed. I do have an update on the cyber shed. So big news. I finally got my the second electrician. He's going to be coming here next week uh, to finish the work. And I've got, I'm going to be doing insulation myself on Sunday. And on Saturday and Sunday, the 12th and 13th, uh, Sheetrock's going in, and HVAC is going in. And then probably the following week, the 20th or so, uh, Mrs. Ozier and I will be doing the floors in the shed and, uh, you know, a little bit of finishing work. But after that, maybe paint. So I'm, I'm hoping by, like, the end of the 20th, um, it'll be ready for move-in, which is great, which is great. Uh, just enough time to move in before we go um, for our long remote studio show. <laughs> but it, we're moving forward, guys. How did the attack in Dallas start? Was it a phishing email? Um, I don't know if they report on what actually happened. They did say that Royal 
um, is known for like reverse phishing. So basically compromise an, an asset callback phishing attacks to right here. This is what it says. Callback phishing. All right. Alex May rides wants to hope that Dakota, Andre and Chris have been tuning in it. Hopefully they have been good to see you. John Dobbins says he attended a GRC webinar where one of the attendees gave your GRC masterclass a shout out. Very cool. Yeah, I'm very proud of the GRC masterclass. Um, Andre Escobar, the, mem the membership of the squad, it gives you access to um, the emote, uh, the emote tray down here, uh, which is pretty fun. And then also um, very seldomly, I'll do exclusive membership only uh, posts on YouTube and stuff. Um, the membership is more an opportunity for people to support the channel and help me financially basically do the things uh, that, that make the show a little bit more um, richer and fuller. Um, but I do make it a point that I do not paywall. And like, you will still get the same threat briefing. I don't, I don't do a special threat briefing for paid members, okay? It's basically like Patreon. You're getting, you're getting, you're helping <laughs> you're helping the channel basically because I do this every day. What do you think about Amazon laying AWS workers off? I didn't hear about that soul shine. What's GRC? It's mentioned a lot. Nathan Gaps. GRC is governance, risk, and compliance. Um, let's do this really quick for Nathan Gaps since he's got the Simply Cyber baton. Let's do this. Um, is this a, I have so many here. This is an older video, Nathan, but it's a good one. Actually, actually, hold on. I got a whole playlist, Nathan. Nathan, you give me an hour. Give me an hour of your time, Nathan, and you will fully have an appreciation for GRC. Okay. Nathan gaps. There you go. GRC for the win. All right. I am going to be getting a remote studio laptop. I did some research last week. Slade says it's the boring side. What's the boring side, Slade? What's boring? Hold on. Oh, the boring side of IT. That's okay, Slade. I'm on a mission to make GRC socially acceptable. Um, GRC, is there any way we can get more acronyms in cybersecurity? Possibly. Hey, let's talk about the GR, uh, the TCM stuff. Here we go. Um, TCM, Practical Web Application Security Testing, is currently a dollar. What's the code? Or is it just a dollar? Is it just a dollar? There's probably got to be a code, right? Oh, no, it's already applied. There you go. Get on this right now, guys. Grab it for a buck. Thanks, Amadou Ba. Have a good weekend. All right. Well, I'll be buying this. I don't want to log in on screen, but let me see, really. Can I log in? The thing is, I have like a student login, and I also have an instructor login, so it's a little different. Oh, guys, by the way, you're about to see my, um, on LinkedIn, I'm going to add a new job. Um, hold on one second. Because I need another job. Oh, my God. I can't log in right now. I'll do it later. Um, I have to change my credit thing. Credit union. Paranoid. So stop because talk to French. Okay. Yeah, definitely grab up that um, practical malware or practical web application security testing. All the content over at TCM is excellent. Okay. Zoom is to try to catch a password. Yeah. Um... By the way, Gary Ruddle, I don't know if he's still here, but um, his talk, uh, his Simply Cyber Live guest appearance on May 25th is all going to be around cyber threat intelligence and um, how, how to best utilize it and the real truths behind it. It's going to be cool. What's an API in layman's terms? An API is um, basically... An API allows you to write software that interfaces with another system cleanly. It, you can call a function on another system. That's what an API is.
Is GMTA Good Morning Threat Actors, Kimberly? That's what I think when I see it. Oh, Marcus Granny. That's a good call. It's like your waiter at a restaurant. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, so the Cyber 101 course... The Cyber 101 course, I, I've told people it's going to have college transferable credits. It's going to be a large course. I've been working um, it, it, as all part of this process in order to get it where I need it to be able to be transferable for college credit and stuff. I had to get a job um, with Mount Wachusett Community College up in Massachusetts. So you'll see on LinkedIn, I, I, I had to go through um, interview process and background screening and reference checks and all that other stuff. And of course I wasn't worried about that, but um, it finally went through. I got accepted yesterday. I, I had to fill up. I think I'm like in the Massachusetts pension fund now too, but I have to, uh, um, I'm, I'm getting onboarded um, next week. And um, so you'll see that come out as like a new job on LinkedIn, but it's all the whole point of it. It's all a long-term play to be able to deliver value to the community and have not just a sick, um, introduction to cybersecurity, um, really wide and slightly deep course, but also to make it um, college credits for you guys if you want college credits. Yeah, Eric the Gray, it'll have college transfer credits. Like I'm part of the course, I will make it so you can uh, uh, download a bundle and you just have to fill out a couple uh, blank spaces like your name and what college you want it to go to and stuff, and you'll be able to hand it to the um, to the to the the school or university that you want to go to yeah jenny i've got a couple jobs yeah i definitely have a lot of jobs right now what's the worst dr you've had to manage in your career um well fortunately i haven't had like a full dr i've had you know major incidents that you know compromised overall um productivity but I think the worst thing I've ever seen is uh, during, I can't really say it on stream. Uh, I don't think I'm under NDA, but basically put it this, I'll, I'll make it as generic as I can. Um, connecting two different businesses networks because of a merger, right? Like this was coming for months. Like we, mer we acquired and we're going to merge connecting them. And the, the other one, was actively compromised. And when you connected it, you immediately started seeing traffic coming in trying to compromise us. Um, and we shut it down so we could do some investigation. But when we shut it down, that site lost internet access because we had shut off internet. All internet was gonna come through our site in order for us to use our security technologies to you know, manage, monitor, adjust, and all these other things, not have a backdoor to the internet. Well, the problem is, some of the services provided by that business, some very, very serious services provided by that were cloud services and required internet access. So by cutting off the infection, we also cut off internet access, which cut off those services. And um, there was almost a very, very, very serious issue. Um, we were able to um, navigate that without any issue, but it was a serious thing. All right. Yeah, love me some Raspberry Pi. Very good. Yeah, no, it had nothing to do with users. It was much, much more, um, much, much more serious than just like a user issue. I mean, it was, it was massive. Which just goes to show you, man, you, you really, you really got to understand what services are in, depending on the internet. And the problem is, you you know, the business doesn't show up to some of those meetings. All right, guys, what do we got? 199 people in here, guys. It's Friday. I hope, I hope you guys um, had a great show. I hope you had a great week. I want to thank all of you for being here. Remember, next week, all week, 8 a.m. Eastern time. Stay tuned. We got some um, infosec Pat. Uh, YouTube content creator, offensive content. He's coming on the show next Thursday. I'm going to have a produce video dropping on Wednesday um, regarding 
uh, basically using ChatGPT to uh, be a cyber career counselor in a very, you know, I, I'll show you, I'll demonstrate it on stream, the questions, the prompts you should be asking, um, et cetera. It, it'll be a good time. I hope you enjoy it. All right, y'all. Thanks all very much. It was great to see you. Have a wonderful day. And until next time, stay secure. Bye.